they believe so much in democracy and they defend it that it would be impossible according to the U.S. Constitution for the United States to accept Jesus as a ruler himself, even if he came down on the clouds, wow. because he wasn't elected, nor was he born in the United States. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good to have you back, Tiffany. Thank you so much for having me here. Today we're going to talk about the Antichrist in Islam and we'll cover the Antichrist in uh, Sunni Islam and also in Shia Islam. Amazing. And uh, we left the last uh, episode at the part where we were talking about the interpretation of the mark of the beast. And we mentioned how this mark, well, in Christianity they consider this character of the beast to be the Antichrist. Yes. And how he would be marking the people with a mark on their forehead or on their right arm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also connected it to a passage in Exodus uh, where the Israelites are leaving and they don't have time for the bread to rise. And uh, instead of the bread rising, uh, it was supposed to also remind the Israelites that the, the rise itself was happening with them and with Moses. He was the one that was rising with his people out of Egypt in, in the place of the, of the rising of the, of the bread. And um, I just wanted to draw your attention to this photograph here. I thought it was pretty interesting. And this is called the Teflon, and it's basically uh, something which is done by the Jews um, as a literal interpretation of those verses that we spoke about in Exodus, where they literally will mark their arm, sometimes their left, sometimes their right, and they'll mark their forehead too. So there'll be a mark on the forehead and a mark, um, you know, on their arm. That is very clear. And so it really struck me when you explained this and you, you actually brought it back to the Old Testament and you showed that there is a verse which explains exactly what is, is being talked about. It's using the exact same terminology. Uh, uh, how has nobody ever connected the two? Uh, it really amazed me. And this photograph is extremely clear. The, it is the, extremely clear, um, isn't it? A mark on the head and a mark on the, the on hand. The hand. Yeah. And, and so this goes exactly... Uh, side by side, it matches then, uh, if we assume that the character of the Antichrist is going to come, and let's also assume that he's going to be a person who's denying that Jesus is the Messiah, and we said that Christians and Muslims can't be the character of the Antichrist, mm -hmm. um, then it would match that the Antichrist would be a Jew, and it would also match the many narrations that we have in Islam, which all mention that uh, that the Antichrist would have Jewish followers, uh, many of them. Yes, it certainly would add up in that way. That, that's amazing. I mean, I, I'm seeing how all the dots are connecting. Okay, so let's talk now about the description of the Antichrist Dajjal in Islam. We basically have uh, a plethora of hadiths, of narrations which, which have been recorded and safeguarded by the household of the Prophet Muhammad and a lot of narrations uh, that was narrated by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad which describe the Antichrist Dajjal. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about the description of the Dajjal in Islam. Uh, there's narrations which state that the Prophet Muhammad had said that the Antichrist Dajjal would be one-eyed. And he emphasized a lot. Most of the hadiths that describe what the Antichrist in Islam looks like, it describes him as having one eye. And usually it's it's the fact that he's blind in the right eye and his left eye is functioning. And um, 
his right eye will be described as like having as if there's like a floating grape in it or uh, that it's just not functioning altogether. Some narrations place the eye in the middle of the forehead um, and it is also one of the other descriptions of the Dajjal in the Islamic traditions that he has words, letters that are written in his forehead. And these letters are plain and everybody's able to see it and those who can read and those who cannot read are able to read what it says. And those letters are kaf, fa, ra, those uh, Arabic letters which together make the word uh, kufr, disbelief, or kaf, alif, uh, fa, ra, which make the word kafir or disbelief. And uh, so there's a group of Muslims that are literalists that are waiting for an antichrist who resembles a cyclops type figure and they're waiting for somebody to appear that would actually have these letters uh, etched into his forehead. Uh, sometimes they think that maybe it will appear uh, due to the wrinkles in his skin on his forehead, that it would just naturally make this, or maybe it's a birthmark uh, where these letters could be, could be written there. And they also look for a character that's blind in one eye. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi in other narrations describes the Antichrist um, as having red hair in a narration, as having extremely curly hair uh, in another narration, whereas Jesus, peace be upon him, in the description of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi has like long uh, flowing hair that sits on his shoulders that's neither curly nor straight. It's kind of like a mixture in between. And the Dajjal is the uh, opposite of that. Okay. The Antichrist in the narrations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu um, he has the ability to perform a lot of miracles, a lot. And he comes forward and he's, he's pretty much doing all of the miracles that Jesus does. Most notably, the Antichrist has the ability in Islam to raise the dead. Okay. Um, and there's many narrations that state that he will go by people and he will raise for them from the dead their, their dead mother, their dead father. Um, and uh, this, will be, this will be a deception, though. Uh, in, in, in most of the narrations, it's stating that he has this legion of demons that are working with him and they're traveling with him and they take the image or the shape of the deceased persons and therefore he deceives those people into thinking that he's doing this. And that, that also this idea that the Antichrist is able to mimic these divine uh, miracles proves in it and of itself that human beings are unable to distinguish and tell who is the divinely appointed person versus who's somebody who's a deceiver or a charlatan based on miracles. People don't have the ability to distinguish. Mm -hmm. And those narrations also prove that um, believing in somebody based on miracles alone, it's, it's, uh, it's not a valid way of, of telling or else everybody would have had the right, uh, everybody would have been right in following the Antichrist because he is going to come and perform great miracles. Yeah. yeah. And not all of the miracles, by the way, are deceptions. And so there's an incident that takes place with the Antichrist where he actually, there's, there's a believing man and this young man, uh, he comes to the Dajjal and the Dajjal demands from him that he worships him. He refuses, so the Dajjal cuts this man in half. So he's clearly dead. And then the Dajjal resurrects him uh, in front of the people. And then he asks him, okay, who am I? Am I not your Lord? And the believer laughs and says that basically now he's more sure than ever that he is the Antichrist. And this is an event that takes place right before the coming, the second coming of, of Jesus, peace be upon him. So, so he has these fake miracles where the devils, the devils are, are shape-shifting and it's like an illusion. It's not true. It's yeah. not a real resurrection that's being performed. 
And there's also these real resurrections that are being performed in actuality. Okay. Yeah. It's it, That's very, a little scary, to be honest, the way that you're describing it. It sounds like the, the regular person, uh, many of the regular people might fall into the trap of being fooled. By oh, absolutely. And his powers don't just stop there, Tiffany. Uh, it states that he'll basically pass through certain countries and he'll command the earth. He'll just stand there and he'll say, treasures of the earth, come forward. And then he moves on. And that after he moves on, all of the treasures of that land will come out of the ground. He, the narrations state that he'll supplicate to God that it rains and the, the sky will bring down its rain and the earth will bring, bring forward its fruit at his command. Wow. Um, there's also narrations that state that he'll pass through certain areas and he'll call the people to, to worship him or to follow him and support him. And the people of that town will refuse and then a drought will, will hit them, a plague will hit them. So, so everything that's happening around this Antichrist character, it, it, it's always appearing as if he has absolute divine enforcement. Yeah, I can see no difference between what we've read about uh, prophets who did amazing miracles like Jesus and this description. It's, it's very, uh, it's very, it, it seems that he has great power in this world uh, over life and over the elements and, and all of these things. No, the, the amount of miracles that the Antichrist performs in Islamic narrations are more than the amount of miracles that the Prophet Muhammad is recorded as having done. Wow. So they're expecting a supernatural being to come and that uh, is traveling basically even in some narrations with a mountain of bread and a mountain of, of, of fire. Uh, or he travels with heaven and he travels with hell. And, and the Muslims are warned that if they come across this, this Antichrist and he invites you to go into his heaven, don't go into it because his heaven is actually hell yeah. and his hell is actually heaven. Oh so, so he's reversing, yeah. he's changing, he's turning upside down the, the, the understandings of religion. It also states that uh, him and his companions, uh, well, it states that he's followed by 70,000 Jews from Asfahan in some narrations. You know, so Iranian Jews uh, are following him. Um, in, in other narrations, he is basically taking his companions and they're committing all of the abominations and all of the things which were were forbidden to be done, he's making that uh, halal or acceptable uh, for them to do. Okay. Uh, and yet the people are following him. And it seems also that he, the majority of his followers, he has an, an, an immense amount of power over women in particular. And, and most of his followers in the narrations are, are females. And there's narrations that state that even when certain battles are taking place in the end times, that the Muslim army will, will uh, a rumor will, will come out amongst the ranks that basically the Dajjal has entered into the town where their women are and everybody's going to freak out and they're going to want to hurry up and go home because they're afraid that the Dajjal is going to make a, a great fitna amongst, amongst their women. So these are are a lot of the uh, narrations which are kind of describing um, the Dajjal, what he looks like, the events that are going to take place. Uh, there's mentioning of certain battles that happen. There's mentioning, there's a whole group of Hadith narrations that mention that it's, uh, that the, the Antichrist is not killed until Jesus, the son of Mary, comes down and with his own breath, he just speaks and, and him speaking, it causes the death of the Antichrist okay. and also uh, the death of his, of his army. They get rid of him. And then there's a whole other group of narrations and hadiths which mention that the Antichrist is killed 
and in particularly crucified, but not by Jesus, but by the Mahdi, uh, that the Mahdi takes him or the cotton takes him and crucifies him uh, in some narrations in a Kufa, in some narrations he's killed in, in Sham. So it, it differs from one narration to another. Okay. And then we have a very interesting group of narrations that pertain to the Antichrist. And they pertain to the Antichrist's appearance in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu okay. So one of them we had mentioned in the Armulus episode, and that was the narration where um, there was a Christian who was at sea and they lost their way until they came across this island. And then there was a monastery. And before they go into the monastery, they find this beast type creature with, with a lot of hair and it's covering his face and his back of his head. And, and he says, come on in. Yes. Uh, there's somebody over here that wants to meet you. They go in and, and they see this man that's chained up. Uh, and so he's alive and he's alive at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he begins to ask about, he, he seems to be confused. He don't know what day, what age uh, they're living in, but it seems like he's, he's been waiting for a long time and he's waiting for particular signs. And he begins to ask them, did this happen? Did that happen? And then he finally asks them if there's a prophet that had appeared, you know, in Medina amongst them. And when he hears that he has, the Antichrist says, well, that's good. And it's better for those people if they knew what I know to follow him. Um, and, then, and then he reveals himself that he's the Antichrist and he's actually waiting uh, to come out and wreak uh, havoc on the earth. Hmm. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he, when he heard this, he says, uh, I very much like this narration because is this not exactly what I had told you guys about the Antichrist? And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you know, he, he makes a statement where basically he says he's in the he's in the middle of the sea over here. And he refers to the sea and the Syrian sea. And then he says, no, he's over here in this sea. And then he says, no, he's in the east. He's in the east. So there's this, this um, connection in many of the narrations that the Antichrist will emerge in the east. And this was the first of the narrations that mentioned that the Antichrist is alive at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there's a whole nother group of hadiths that also state that he is alive in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, but they're pertaining to a particular character whose name is Ibn Sayyad, the son of Sayyad. Okay. So the story of this character called the son of Sayyad in the narrations is that this guy was a Jew. Okay, so once again you have this... this, this uh, theme of the Antichrist being Jewish. Okay. He's a Jewish boy, and he starts gaining a reputation amongst the people at that time because he has the ability to, to prophesize things. He starts to prophesize things to the people, and it comes true. Okay. But not everything. Most of it comes true. Some of the stuff don't come true, and he's gaining quite the reputation. The news goes back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he takes one of his companions and in this particular narration it's Amr ibn Khattab and they go on an expedition to check it out because now the Muslims had heard these narrations from the Prophet Muhammad and there's this weird boy that appeared that's able to prophesize and people are tr beginning to treat him almost like he's a prophet okay. and he's a Jewish boy. And so the Prophet Muhammad goes out with his companions to check it out because the Muslims are afraid. They think the Antichrist has appeared. Okay. So they begin to approach the boy and they see him and he's sitting there. And a conversation takes place between the boy and between the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And basically the Prophet Muhammad asks him, do you confess 
that I'm the messenger of God? And the boy responds and he says, do you confess that I'm the messenger of God? Okay. And then the Prophet Muhammad says, well, I believe in all of God's prophets and messengers. Uh, he says to him, he says to him, well, what am I thinking about? And then, and then the boy says, Ad-Dakh. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was thinking about ad or the surah that had just came down upon him, which was the surah of smoke, ad And um, And so Ibn Sayyad in this narration was able to receive half or partial information from the unseen about what it is that the Prophet had, had, had known. And then the Prophet proceeds to call him a liar and to dismiss his claims. And Umar ibn Khattab asks permission from the Prophet Muhammad to kill Ibn Sayyad. Okay. And the Prophet says, what is the use of killing him? Because if he is the Antichrist, you will have no power over him. And if he's not the Antichrist, well, then obviously he would have killed somebody who is innocent. There would be no point to it. And so they go away. Okay? The rest of the story, though, is fascinating because now then what happens basically is that the people remain doubting whether or not Ibn Sayyad is the Antichrist or he's not the Antichrist. And the Prophet Muhammad, after this encounter with him, he did not confirm that he was the Antichrist, but he also didn't deny that he's the Antichrist. Yes. And so the people continued to uh, view that since the Prophet didn't deny it, then it must be the case, right? Mm -hmm. And they continued to doubt and believe, really, that he probably is the Antichrist. And they were treating him as such for many, many years. And the narrations record that after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, he became extremely depressed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Ibn Sayyid became extremely depressed. And in one narration, he's talking to, uh, to one of the Muslims, you know, and he's telling him, he's saying, you know how many times that I've thought about just getting a rope and hanging it to the to a tree and and hanging myself from the treatment that I'm receiving from the people and the way that they're teasing me and all the things that they have said to me and 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 you know and their behavior towards me because they think that I'm antichrist I'm extremely depressed and yet did the muslims not remember the words of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that the Antichrist would never be able to enter into Mecca and Medina. And yet here I am, I'm walking through the, 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 the city of Medina. Did the Muslims not forget, did the Muslims forget that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that the Dajjal would be a Jew and yet I've accepted Islam and became a Muslim. Did the Muslims forget that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that the Antichrist would not have any children, and yet I have many children? And for this, my grief is, you know, has become too much, and I've thought about suicide. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a very sad narration. Yeah. And then other narrations state that after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi died, he did have a lot of children. He did accept Islam. He was living amongst the Muslims. Uh, but he was still being treated with caution. Yeah. Until towards a certain time period, there's a narration that appears that the people, somebody walks up to Ibn Sayyad and says to him, what the heck happened to your eye? And he says, what do you mean what happened to my eye? 
He says, uh, you're, you're, you're blind, you're one-eyed. He says, how do you not know that you're one-eyed when it's, when it's in your head? And Ibn Sayyid replies, well, if God wanted it to happen, then if God wanted, he could have placed my eye in your staff. So it was like a weird response. Yeah. But it seems that Ibn Sayyid, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Ali, he has two eyes. And after the Prophet's death, uh, he becomes one-eyed. Okay, interesting. And then it also was interesting to know and what increased the suspicion of the companions that Ibn Sayyid is the Antichrist is the fact that all of his children died at some point, so he became childless. Wow. And then there was a battle in which Ibn Sayyid had partook in, and the narration states that he just disappeared. Nobody found his body. The history books registered that he just disappeared. Nobody knows where he went. One day Ibn Sayyid is there, the next day he's not there, he's gone. Is that the end of the story? That's the end of the story of Ibn Sayyid. That is extremely mysterious. It is yeah. mysterious, isn't it? Yes. And and so yeah, and so you now we 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 wonder, is he the Antichrist? Is he not the Antichrist? Well, people went to Imam Ali salam and to the household of the Prophet, and then you find in Shia Islam many traditions that are recorded, uh, narrated from Imam Ali salam or from the Imams of the Ahl Bayt, uh, that are where Imam Ali is swearing that Ibn Sayyad is the Dajjal. Wow. And so if we take the suspicion of the companions and the confirmation of the very family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the fact that it would be a total and absolute uh, gigantic mistake and form of oppression to insinuate that an innocent person is the Antichrist and allow him to suffer for the rest of his life uh, at the hands of people that were discriminating against him instead of absolving him from that fact when you're supposed to be a prophet or a messenger from God. Um, all of these things put together confirm. So the prophet not, not denying that he's the Antichrist, plus the narrations, plus what, what the companions state, they all confirm that Ibn Sayyid was the Antichrist. Okay. And this, this theme now is matching exactly what we learned about the Antichrist in Judaism yeah. and in Christianity, that the Antichrist, uh, it's the spirit, yeah. and the spirit is uh, basically not upon just one person, but it can be upon many people, or that the Antichrist is appearing in different ages and places, that his life is extremely long that he's taking certain forms or that his spirit is going into um, different people and making different appearances throughout history. Um, so that's the story of Ibn Sayyid, the Jewish Antichrist, who was alive at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And was so, you know, he had the audacity to kind of challenge the prophethood of Muhammad. And uh, so it's interesting because, because we have the Antichrist then in Islam posing as a Muslim. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Even though he was not, but he was still posing as one. Yeah. And, and so then that's possible. What do you think about that? Uh, I think it's extremely interesting. And in my mind, uh, it goes back to what we've been learning. And last uh, episode, we discussed how uh, the Antichrist... It, it, Certainly, the verses in the Bible indicate that the Antichrist was also a companion of Jesus. So, uh, you know, uh, how, how we had discussed uh, this person who betrays and all of these things that indicate Judas Iscariot certainly had the spirit of Antichrist. So, uh, seeing that this is a pattern that we see in, in all three of the faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, is, is extremely interesting. And I'm, I'm seeing that my previous understanding of the Antichrist was, was, was not complete at all. I, I, I had always learned that it's just this one figure that's going to come in the end times and oppose Jesus. But 
that's definitely not the whole story, as we can see from, from everything that you've mentioned so far. And you know, there, there is another theory in Islam, um, which is uh, very popular actually, and uh, it is that the Antichrist made an appearance too in the time of Moses as one of the companions of Moses. Really? Yes. And there's even uh, Islamic scholars that have gone on there and made uh, lectures about it, and they have connected the character of the Antichrist with the character of the Samari in the time of, oh. of Moses who called the people to the worship of the calf. Yeah. They state that the Antichrist appeared in the time of Moses and that he will appear in the end time. And so if that narration is correct, then we have the Antichrist appearing in the time of Moses as the Samari, in the time of Jesus as Judas, in the time of Muhammad as Ibn Sayyad, only to return in the, in the end time. And they also point out to certain narrations that state that actually the Samari uh, after he caused the people to worship the calf, uh, he also disappeared in some narrations. He was exiled by Moses instead of killed. So he just goes, uh, goes on and, and, uh, and disappears from the history books exactly as uh, Ibn Sayyad did. And there's this interesting parallel too between the fact that Ibn Sayyad has this desire to hang himself from a tree, which is exactly what Judas Iscariot did yeah. after betraying Jesus, which yeah. is that... He hung himself from the tree. And there's this parallel between the actions of the Samari, who calls the people to the worship of this, this, uh, this false god, this idol made of, of, of uh, gold, right? And between the narrations in Christianity or the understanding that they have that the Antichrist or this son of stone or the uh, son of a statue that will call the people towards the worship of this particular image in the end time, you have also uh, that parallel. That out. is so true, yeah. That, um, it's the same. It's the same. That's crazy. It is crazy. So what now can we, how can we, how can we understand then the other signs though, which is these these signs of the Antichrist having uh, one eye, is it going to be in, in the... Because now we have two different understandings of the Antichrist. One, if, if we look at the narrations in Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and we put them all together, we have, we have the appearance of the Antichrist as a person. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. We have the appearance of the Antichrist as persons, people, yeah. or anybody who's denying that, you know, Jesus is the Messiah or that the Messiah has come is an Antichrist. So you have them appearing as individuals, but you also have this theme from the book of Daniel because it was talking about, about um, these different beasts, and each one of these beasts was like a kingdom, and the association of a kingdom in the end time with the Antichrist. There's not just a a person, but it's an actual country or state. Yeah. Um, and you have also the Jewish connection in between the name Armulus and the fact that it's a play on words, which yeah. is Romulus. Yeah. And the understanding that the Christians had and the followers of Jesus at that time that that the Antichrist or the, the, the figure that was against Jesus is the Roman Empire. Yeah. Because they're the ones that arrested him. They're the ones that at the request of the Jews, uh, they killed him. And that this empire with its emperor, and that's why the theory came out that Nero, for example, um, was the, the Antichrist, Antichrist yeah. because he was sitting at the head of the Roman Empire and at the same time he was persecuting all of the followers of, of Jesus. Yeah. And so if we look a little bit closer at what's happening in the world today, we, we have this, this, many of the Muslim scholars that are coming out, um, and they have talked about the Dajjal being twofold. There's Dajjal as a person, uh, but there's also Dajjal as a system, yeah. okay? 
and the Dajjal as a system, as they would call it, uh, seems to match nothing more than America, because we have America, which was built on Roman principles. Uh, people think that it was built on Christian principles, but even the founding fathers denied that that was the case. Yeah. Um, it says on the money in God we trust, on the U.S. dollar, and and yet on there we have a symbol of God that they use, which is the eye of providence. It's the, the one, one eye. eye. So you have the modern state of Rome. Rome today yeah. is what is the it's United America, States. Yeah, it's like the it's based and on the, the Roman principles, right? The Jewish scholars, Christian scholars, Muslim scholars, when they talk about modern Rome today, they all think of America as a fulfillment of Rome today. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the money and I'm seeing uh, the the language of the Roman Empire. It's written here in, in Latin. Yeah, and there's also this uh, this idea, I mean, it's known from, from biblical scholars that the fourth beast in Daniel is, is a reference to Rome and like also what's mentioned in Revelation. Uh, is also a reference to Rome, um, the the harlot of Babylon and the blood, uh, drinking the blood of the martyrs. And that's understood by scholars to be talking about what happened after Jesus with uh, the oppression and persecution of the Christians by the Roman Empire. So I, but, but obviously the Roman Empire is in the past. So what you're telling me now about this uh, the Roman Empire, not the Roman Empire of old, but the Roman Empire of new, is mind-blowing. Uh, how this could possibly make sense with the scriptures, because obviously we know what time we're living in. Uh, many of the signs of the end times have appeared in our modern world. So if we look in our modern world, like you said, the people, they, the, the, the scholars, they, they have agreed that if, if there is a, a stand-in for Rome in today's day and age, that would, that would be America. That would be America. So the Antichrist, by name, by nature, he has to do, and in all of the religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the character of the Antichrist has directly to do with the Messiah, the Christ, right? Um, he's the opposite of him. Um, and so if we focus on the story of Jesus, the Messiah himself, what do we find? We find that the Jewish Messiah is sent to the Jews. He's supposed to call towards God's rule, right? Mm -hmm. That God is the one who appoints the ruler. And he's supposed to rule the entire world. And that's what the Jews are expecting the Messiah to do even today. So clearly the opposition of the Antichrist and his laws that he comes with, it's, and his ideology has to be the opposite to what Jesus is coming with. Yeah. What Jesus is coming with is he's coming with the law of God and the rule of God and yeah. the Torah, right? Yeah. And he's, he's saying that just as God appointed Adam, just as, as God got mad at Israel when they approached Samuel and wanted to ask for their own king and God said that they're refusing my rule, they're refusing me, um, that Jesus was coming to establish the fact that God had chosen for the entire world a ruler and a people and that ruler is Jesus, the Messiah. The Roman Empire, they weren't, they didn't like that. The Jewish people denied that. They were an antichrist because they were denying that Jesus was the Christ. Yeah. And then the Jewish people, through Judas Iscariot, right, who now is an apostate and uh, left Jesus, denying that he is the Messiah, takes refuge with the Romans. He takes refuge with the Jews, really. He betrays them to the rabbis, and the rabbis, they, they take the matter to the Romans, and they make this tight alliance with Rome in order to betray Jesus. 
And so on a, on a major scale, on a, so that's the microcosm, on the macrocosm in this day and age, you see the exact same thing playing out. You have the Roman Empire, which is America, and then you have a Judas Iscariot state, which is the state of Israel, and Judas Iscariot state and the rabbis, they're almost like a colony of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is controlling or America is controlling Israel, and Israel is always uh, using the protection of America, and they're going to them, and they're their they're, they're, they're best friends, their allies. So that's happening on a on a grand scale. <laughs> I, when you're saying this right now, it's really hitting me. This is just history repeating itself. It is history repeating itself, and and America, in that sense, would be the Antichrist, and you could definitely call them that because they're posing to be promoting and believing in the ideals of Jesus Christ, while in reality their message and what they're promoting is the exact opposite of Judaism, and it's, it's the exact opposite of uh, the message of Jesus. Jesus was calling towards the supremacy of God, that God is the one who appoints the ruler, and that, that it's the Messiah and, and those who God chooses that have the right to be king. Yeah. America is promoting the idea that, that no, there's no place for religion in the state. There has to be a separation of religion and state. And, state yeah. and, and it's actually the people, you, are the ones who must choose, not God. It's the people who must choose who is the ruler. Yeah. But we still believe in Jesus and we're promoting Jesus. And, and Jesus is our Lord and Savior and his hand is over us. So they're lying. They're deceiving the people, and they're bringing a message that's contradictory. The message that they're carrying is actually the same as the Roman Senate and the Roman Empire. Yeah, it, right? it does not make sense. It absolutely does not make sense. If I imagine going back in history and in Jesus' time, if, if uh, I mean, did Jesus say, accept the rulership of the Roman Empire, but still believe in me on the side? No, that's not what he, he came to do. He came for, to establish God's kingdom. Exactly. And so... Uh, you have that, and then you have the Jewish state, which is which is basically like a, a state that God is upset with. This uh, state of Israel, their stance today is the same stance that it was in the time of Jesus. Um, and so people have to find where is Jesus in this time? Where is the Messiah in this time? If, if America is the Antichrist, and certainly if we can bring that picture back up again, um, and at the end of this video we're going to show you guys a montage of, of, of clips where you can see the one eye uh, permeating through all aspects of American culture and uh, America's institutions and companies and organizations. It's almost like if you had one thing that America could be identified by, if they could be identified by, by one thing or one sign, then it would be basically uh, the, the sign of the, of the one eye. Mm -hmm. It's also an interesting parallel, which you had pointed out before, between this uh, green statue um, that the Antichrist in Judaism, yeah, Armulus, mm, is the, the son of. With the, the green, yeah, so the son of Satan yes. and the statue which is green, which is, yeah, I, I had this question. Uh, I, it, what, what struck me when I was reading it was there's only one green statue that comes to mind, and that's the Statue of Liberty. Um, and so, and, yeah, isn't that odd? It says that, that the Antichrist is green. Yeah. And you have the money of America being green. Yeah. You have the Statue of Liberty green. Yeah. And the story of Armulus, the Antichrist, is the, is the son of a Roman statue, a Roman goddess, and mm -hmm. you have uh, America also having over it and being identified and associated with always this um, Roman statue. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was really, when I read it, I started to see these little pieces adding up together, and, uh, and I had so many questions, and this really just confirms that it actually does all add up and, and make 
sense. Uh, I'm really blown away. I'm really blown away because it is not what people were expecting. And that's exactly the point, I think. So let's, let's put it all together real quick and see if this, this theory matches. Mm -hmm. So you have now um, America. Uh, it's a country. That's matching with the prophecies in Daniel, which we spoke about. Mm -hmm. You have America's sign that's one-eyed. Mm -hmm. It's associated with the one-eyed. That's exactly uh, what we have here. Mm -hmm. We have written on the forehead, and if the forehead is the thought uh, or the belief system of a person, as we mentioned in the last episode, you know, the mark on the forehead. Yes. So, so if the Dajjal has on his forehead disbeliever, or disbelief, then it would definitely match with America because America disbelieves in the idea of the merging of church and state. Yeah. They don't believe in that. Yeah. If they believe so much in democracy and they defend it, that it would be impossible according to the U.S. Constitution for the United States to accept Jesus as a ruler himself, even if he came wow. down on the clouds, wow. because he wasn't elected, nor was he born in the United States. That's so Jesus would never qualify. The, law, the Constitution itself is built in such a way that Jesus would never have a chance of, of ruling or leading the United States. That is, that's crazy. I mean, I, I think your, your average American would never think of such a thing, but it's absolutely true. Yes. So... Um, America is also, it's matching the Antichrist in the sense that it is uh, deceiving the Jewish people and has caused the Jewish people to accept the concept of democracy or the rulership of the people and people electing instead of listening to their own prophets or their own kings that are uh, chosen uh, by God. Uh, they've made the system of Israel also a democratic system. So if, a, if the Messiah was to come to Israel, he would also have no chance of ruling Israel except if they elected him. So the same thing. It the, same the same thing again. Thing. Wow. And so, yeah, then... Now we're just left with, so America is ticking all of the boxes, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly at the center of it, there could be a manifestation of the spirit of the Antichrist as an individual who is behind the scenes of the, um, the, in, the in the shadows behind the American government, mm -hmm. or an individual, that spirit of the Antichrist, um, could be uh, in, in, in also a person or multiple people in the time of the appearance of Jesus. But now, how do we find Jesus? How do we find the Messiah if he appears in this time, in this day and age? It would have to be then somebody whose message is opposite and contradictory to the message of America or the Roman Empire, but at the same time, so he, he must be somebody whose ideology would be be one that is so opposite to it that he would almost be considered an enemy of the state if he propagated it. Yeah. It would have to be an anti-democratic message. He would It would have to be a message that's matching actually the message of God in the Quran and the Torah and the Bible, yeah. the message where God in the Quran says, verily, I'm making a caliph in the land. I'm the one who's making a king in the land. Um, it, would, it would have to be opposite to that. And the only message that's opposite to that is the message that, no, you can never, uh, actually one of the greatest sins that you could do is try to elect your own leader. It's only God who's able to elect the leader. Yeah. I mean, you said it, that's it, that's it. Uh, it's, it seems so, it seems so strange that, that, it's, uh, that it's so simple, just going back to what has the message been from the very beginning since God created Adam. It's that he, he picks the ruler. That's God's message and that's, that's your message. I really can't wait to continue. Um, I'm, I'm 
extremely interested in this topic and uh, every time that we meet I, I just learn so much. Um, what we learned today was amazing and I yeah, I, I think I'm going to be thinking about it for, for several days, uh, how everything just fits together. When you put everything side by side, it just it fits together and it makes sense. So thank you so much for, for teaching me these things. And thank you, Tiffany, for joining us. And I'll see you again soon, inshallah. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us on these uh, three episodes where we explored the concept of the Antichrist in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, it's been an amazing series, and I've, I've really learned so much, and I hope that it's been beneficial for you too. And I think now it's, it's really clear that, that we see there's a lot of repetition, and there's also this concept of uh, Messiah versus anti-Messiah uh, repeating itself throughout time. And uh, we also see that just like there, there is the, the individual, there's also uh, a, a group. Uh, so just like we have Jacob, the individual, as Israel, we have Israel as a nation. And just as we have uh, the Spirit of God in Jesus, we have the Spirit of God uh, over all of these prophets and messengers. And just the same, we have the Spirit of Antichrist and the the larger spirit of Antichrist as a nation as a system. So um, I think that that that's really clear and it's one of the the most amazing things that that we've seen demonstrated throughout the, the story of God and throughout the scriptures. Stay tuned for much more to come and uh, I can't wait to see you back on this journey. <laughs>